In this session, we're going to consider the penitential psalms. A penitential psalm is a psalm of confession and a request for forgiveness and a desire uh, to repent. Uh, there have historically been seven of these psalms that are identified as penitential psalms. We're going to look at the middle of those, Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a psalm of David, and the context for that psalm is stated in the superscription that precedes the psalm. It's when Nathan came to David to confront him after David's sin with Bathsheba. Now, most of us are pretty familiar with that sordid affair in David's life. It's recorded for us in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. In chapter 11 of that book, it says that David stayed at Jerusalem when, when normally the kings went off to war, and it suggests that David was in a position of comfort and, uh, and relaxation when he spied a woman who was bathing. He, in his power as king, summoned her to come. He lay with her, and he gets the word a little while later that she is pregnant. Uh, David tries to cover this up. He calls uh, Bathsheba's husband home from the battlefield uh, and encourages him to be with his wife, but he refuses even uh, David even tries to get him drunk, and that doesn't work. And so David sends Uriah back to the field uh, with a, a secret message. A message went to the commander to say, send Uriah into the heat of the battle and then withdraw from him so that he could be killed. That's exactly what happened. Uriah was killed in battle as well as other men with him. And word comes back to David that this has happened. And David says, I got away with it. He takes Bathsheba now as his wife. They have the son, and perhaps a year now has gone by, and David thinks that he's gotten away with this, and yet we know that he hasn't. Nathan, this preacher, comes to him in chapter 12 and says to David, uh, there's something I need to tell you about in your kingdom. There's a poor man, and he's got a little ewe lamb, a female lamb who is like a daughter to him, who lives in his home, who sleeps in his arms. And there's another man who has a lot of cattle, and lambs, and, and very wealthy, and a guest came. And this rich man, rather than slaughter one of his own animals, he takes the lamb from the poor man, and he slaughters it, and he serves it to his guests. And when David hears this, he is incensed. Uh, there is virtue, virtue signaling here, because he's like, that should not be. That man needs to pay four times what he has taken. And Nathan looks him in the eye and says, in Hebrew, these two words, you're the man. You're the man. Ethahaish. You're the man, David. And David is broken. And he prays a response that in Hebrew is also two words. I've sinned against the Lord. I've sinned against the Lord. And this prayer of repentance is what comes out of that. This prayer is divided into two parts as our, our penitential prayer should be. The first is a prayer to remove a prayer to remove. He says in verse one, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. Notice how David owns this sin. It is my sin that he's confessing. He, he prays four times, have mercy, blot out, wash me, cleanse me. He uses all three Hebrew words for sin, transgression, which means to break the law, so a legal definition. He says, my iniquity, which suggests an internal brokenness, a disharmony, the internal consequences of sin, what it does to our souls. And then the word sin, which means to miss the mark, to, to fail to uh, fulfill God's purpose and God's design. All of those David has done. And he says the basis for forgiveness is not uh, my goodness or that I'm deserving, but it says, according to your steadfast love, according to your compassion, uh, your chesed, your faithful covenant love, God, and your compassion, your feeling with us, your mercy uh, towards me. On that basis, forgive me. Verse four, Rather, verse 3, he says, I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. This is the beginning of David's confession. He says, uh, I am speaking the same. That's what a confession is. In the Greek, it's homologeo, the same word. Uh, David acknowledges the truth. He speaks reality. He agrees with God. This is what I have done. He says, I can't escape it. It's always in front of me. My guilt is always there, even if I am putting up a, a, a show for everyone else. I know. 
Uh, this is a theme that is uh, found in, in literature. I think of Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart, or Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, or Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, these stories that describe a person who's gotten away with something and yet internally their sin is always before them. And David writes, verse four, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Uh, now you may ask, didn't David sin against more than just God? Of course, he sinned against Bathsheba, against Uriah, against his family, her family. Uh, he sinned against the nation. He sinned against his army who did his deadly business. Uh, David had sinned against a lot of people, but he says, you, God, ultimately, uh, you ultimately have I sinned against, uh, and you are right. You are absolutely justified in judging me. Verse 5, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. You teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Uh, David here feels his iniquity so deeply, he says, it's as if I have always sinned. I, I don't think David here is referring to the doctrine of original sin. I don't think that's necessarily uh, where this goes. I think David is speaking here hyper, hyperbolically. He's exaggerating because he feels so, so deeply that he has sinned, and this is who he is for so long. God desires integrity. He desires truth in the secret part, uh, that our inside would match our outside. And David returns to a request in verse 7. He says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Uh, hyssop was a plant that was used in the ceremonial uh, cleansing uh, in the temple. Uh, the hyssop uh, branch could contain little droplets of blood or of water. And so it was used uh, first in the Passover when they were wiping the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. And it was also used in the temple for the sprinkling uh, and, and sacrifice. And so David is invoking that language of, of cleansing uh, with blood, uh, most likely. Also, the metaphor of, of washing me to be whiter than snow. Uh, snow was not common in Jerusalem, but it did snow. And when snow falls, it covers everything as a blanket. And David says, I, I want that atoning cover uh, of, your, of your blood, the blood of the lamb. Verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. There's that internal brokenness and disharmony. Uh, verse 9, hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. That record you keep, God, of my sins. Would you blot them out? Would you cover them with ink? Would you turn away from my sins? That's the first half of the psalm. David has a heartfelt prayer for uh, the removal of his sin. But there's a second component that is equally as important, and that is David prays that God might replace, he might replace that sin with a new heart. Replacement, verses 10 through 19. He writes in verse 10, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That word create is the very second word of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. Bareshith bara. God Create in me, David says, a new heart. Where there was nothing there, make something. Make a new heart, a, a fresh start, a, and renew a right spirit, that inner person, that right attitude, restore it to me. Verse 11 contrasts with that. He says, cast me not away from your presence or take not your Holy Spirit from me. I think uh, David had a, a front row seat to what that looked like when he was an associate of King Saul. You recall that uh, King Saul disobeyed God and as a result of multiple violations, uh, David uh, watched as God removed his spirit from Saul and sent an evil spirit to torment him. David had a front row seat to that and he wanted nothing of it. So he said, don't take your Holy Spirit uh, for me. Don't cast me from your presence. It's, a, it's one of those rare references to the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. In fact, all three of these verses, 10, 11, and 12, will reference uh, the Spirit. And verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. What David is praying for here is transformation or what we call repentance. The New Testament says repentance is a renewing of the mind that results in completely different behavior, a change of behavior. 
David is praying for a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit, a new start. It is not enough just to clean up the outside, just to remove. There must be replacement. It's, a, it's like if someone found a termites in their house that were eating up the foundation and, and climbing up the walls and chewing up the house, and they said, well, I'll just put a fresh coat of paint on it. That's not good enough. David wants a fresh start, a new start. In Ezekiel, it says that the Lord would take the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. That's what David is praying for here. Uh, David then moves from his prayer of replacement to saying, here's what I will do. Here's my promise to you. First, verse 13, I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. I will teach. Uh, David wants to redeem his story for the benefit of others. And in fact, here we are, 3,000 years later, his story is instructive. It's teaching us today. And so this is a prayer that says, God, uh, I've, I've done a terrible thing, but I want you to redeem it. I want you to make something of it. I want this to turn out to be a blessing to others in some way. And that's what David is praying for here. Verse 14, he says, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Open uh, my lips, O Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Not only does David say, I'm going to teach, but he says, I will worship you. I suspect that David has not been able to worship very well until he is at this point of repentance. And indeed, David had said elsewhere in Psalm 66, 18, that if I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. He doesn't listen to our worship when we're not right with him in this way. And finally, David will say in verses 16 and 17, I will surrender. I'll teach, I'll worship, and I will surrender. Verse 16, for you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You'd not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Uh, David is king. He could offer thousands of animals to sacrifice, but he says that's not what you desire. You desire a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Uh, David had learned this, no doubt, from his mentor, Samuel, the prophet, who said, to obey is better than sacrifice. I'd rather have your heart uh, than the multitude of animals' sacrifices. In Psalm 50, God says, I have the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need your sacrifices. I want your heart. And so David surrenders his heart and says, here's my brokenness, my contrite heart. Remake me. Remake me. The psalm concludes with another request, a prayer, just as it began. Verse 18, do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Bulls will be offered on your altar. Jerusalem, Zion, this represented the community of God. This was the city. And the broken walls, of course, are metaphorical here. David's sin has not been done in isolation. Sometimes we fool ourselves and we think that, oh, we can, we can sin and no one will ever know and there'll, no, there'll be no consequence outside of ourselves. But that's the lie perhaps that David told himself, but it's just not true. Uh, David's sin had an impact on his family, uh, on his community, on the army, on his nation. And metaphorically speaking, the walls were broken. The walls were broken down, the boundaries have been broken. And people could look at David and say, well, hey, if the king did that, then why can't I? And so David's moral authority had been compromised. And so his prayer here is that the repentance process, this replacement process would also include the rebuilding of community, the rebuilding of, of trust and his moral authority before the people. Now, one of the interesting things about this Psalm is that when David prays for forgiveness, I believe that God granted it. I believe when David said, have mercy on me, O God, that God gave him mercy, that God forgave him. And the rest of David's life shows that, that he was indeed a man after God's own heart. God answered his prayer. I think the fascinating thing about it is that even though God granted him forgiveness, the means of that forgiveness uh, was not yet complete. That would come a thousand years later through a descendant of David, in fact, through a relationship of David and Bathsheba. They had a son, Solomon, and Solomon would uh, have sons, the kings of Judah, and the lineage of Jesus was traced back to David and back to this union, this adulterous union between David and Bathsheba. Uh, 
In fact, this is mentioned in the genealogy of Matthew. Uh, Bathsheba is one of four women that's mentioned in that genealogy, not by name, but uh, by the circumstance uh, that Jesus is introduced to us as son of Abraham, son of David. And here's his genealogy, and this is in his lineage. And so David's prayer is ultimately answered by his own son, a thousand years later, Jesus Christ, the son of David. And, and that brings me to one final thought that completes this psalm. I said in the narrative account of uh, David's adultery and the murder of Uriah that there were three two-word uh, statements that form that narrative. Bathsheba said, I'm pregnant. David was told by Nathan, you're the man. And David responded by saying, I've sinned against the Lord. All of these two words in Hebrew. And it makes me think of Jesus who is presented by Pontius Pilate before the crowds. And Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, can find no fault in him, no guilt, no reason that Jesus should be crucified. And yet the crowds are screaming for his blood. And Pilate says, may his blood be on your heads. And the people say, we, we receive his blood on our heads. And then Pilate, in two words, presents Jesus before the people in Latin, ecce homo. Behold the man. Behold the man. Jesus became the man. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Jesus became that man. Jesus became the atoning sacrifice for David, for us, and for the whole world. 1 John 2 2 says that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. God meets us where we are. When we come to him in genuine sorrow and grief and confession of our sins and vow repentance and pray for that new heart, that work of transformation takes place by the power of the Spirit and through the atoning work of Jesus. And we can do this work of repentance not because of anything that's great about us, not because we work, but because the Spirit is at work within us, transforming us, giving us a new mind so that we can be innocent uh, because of the blood of Jesus and the working of the Holy Spirit. Trust in the work of the Holy Spirit. That is how we transform our lives. It's not through putting another coat of paint on the house. The Holy Spirit transforms us from the inside out and gives us the power to say no to sin and to live a life of holiness. Learn from these psalms of repentance. There's, you cannot outrun uh, God. When he pursues you, our hearts tell us we need to make it right. We need to pray these prayers of removal and replacement, creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen.